We're moving straight into our second session, how to be board ready as stock markets um, begin and, and, and following the, the, the NASDAQ uh, announcement, uh, they begin to push companies to have diversity on the boards. Now is the time for women and um, diverse members of our community to prepare themselves for to get a board seat. Um, this has always been a real topic of interest for the women and wealth community. And we're gonna be discussing now how we can ready, ready ourselves the challenges that we might encounter and what to do and ultimately how we can get a seat at the table. So I'm thrilled to introduce um, our co-host, Jim McCann, who is the chair of Pyram Media and also founder and chair of 1-800-Flowers. Um, Judy Washington, Senior Vice President and Chief Marketing Communications and Customer Experience Officer at Trinity Health. Maria Pinelli, Board Member at Claren Acquisition Corp. And Deborah Lee, Co-Founder of the Monix Collective, all who have a wealth of experience on uh, on board. So, hi everyone, welcome. Hey Julia. Good afternoon. Hello. Hi Julia. Hi, great to see you. So um, Jim, I'm going to go to you first. Just set set the scene for us in terms of um, what what you have seen as a member of both public and private boards particularly over the last 12 months when it comes to driving further diversity at the board level? Well, I think the trend has been a trend for a long time that uh, any of the boards that I'm involved with, either, as you say, in the private world, the not-for-profit world, or in the public uh, for-profit world, all of the boards that I know or in, in have some connection to or maybe serve on are all looking to diversify their boards. Uh, so that creates a wonderful opportunity right now and a point in time, uh, both as we come out of uh, uh, what hopefully seems like we'll be coming out of COVID uh, and, and the opportunities that you identified in, in setting up today's discussion about the opportunity to think differently, to reset uh, expectation standards, goals. Uh, I think just a wonderful time for people who aspire to serve on a board. First of all, they have to understand why they want to. But it's just a wonderful time, and I think you've gathered a, a wonderful group of people here, uh, uh, all of whom I know in one way or another, who can bring some great advice and counsel to those who see this as a path for additional learning, uh, for, uh, for adventure, for, for opportunity to contribute uh, in all of those worlds, the not-for-profit world, the for-profit private world, and the public company world. And, and Maria, you, you wrote a piece for Worth recently about the top top board issues of which which diversity, equality, inclusion and, and people were one of them. Um, set the scene for us in terms of, of, of what you're seeing at a board level, given given the sort of experience and exposure that you've had. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Juliet. So I've had, you know, 30 years of experience really advising boards and C-suites and, and now I'm am in the role of director. And I I would say, you know, um, you know, what are we seeing today? Absolutely agree with Jim's comments. I mean, there is a need for diversity. Um, you can pick up literally, I mean, it's I was reflecting on Lauren's chat and she said, I can't believe, you know, we're still talking about this, but, you know, you, literally you can pick up any, any study, certainly catalyst, et cetera, that will show how diversity and inclusion really improves financial performance, et cetera. But more importantly, I think, you know, in this time of change and managing through a pandemic, et cetera, you really need fresh perspectives, innovation. You know, you need to start thinking differently differently about business and, you know, how you reach your stakeholders, your customers, so much has changed. And you're not going to get that unless you have diversity of thought and, and inclusion at all levels. And certainly at the board level is one. Now, I mentioned Juliet earlier in a, in a, in a pre, pre meeting we had that I recently had a conversation with a, a friend who runs the search practice at a very large global search firm. And he mentioned to me that he had 41, uh, 20, 21 uh, public company searches going on and 20 private company in uh, private equity portfolio searches going on. And I said, how many of those are uh, asking you to bring diverse candidates? He said, 41, that is all of them. That they all wanted a diversity of all different kinds, including age and color and, and experience sets. Uh, so I think there's a thirst. Uh, we, we can argue about how we got here, but let's let's not argue. Let's in, embrace what's going on here. And I, 
I'd ask Deborah, you know, as someone who, even though you're a young child, that you've been a pioneer on so <laughs> many of these boards. Uh, how are you seeing things change, Deborah? Uh, well, th well, thank you for that. Um, I, I appreciate that introduction, Jim. Uh, I'm feeling older every day, but uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm delighted that we're in a moment uh, where diversity has been, um, um, is being talked about and pressure is being put on companies. Um, and I'll tell you how we got here. Uh, George Floyd's uh, murder on TV. Um, after his murder, um, companies started, um, you know, giving money to social justice organizations and uh, talking about how committed they were to Black Lives Matter and doing lovely PSAs. And young people said, well, if you're that committed, why are there no Black people on your board? Why are there no Black people on your um, senior leadership team? Um, and so companies were embarrassed. They were literally embarrassed. And all of a sudden this summer, you saw a rush uh, from some companies to put at least one black board member or one woman on. Um, and I, you know, you're right, I'm glad it's happening and I hope it continues. Uh, and I hope this moment becomes a movement. And we have been, I've been on boards for over 20 years um, and we've been talking about it a long time. And some companies have made great progress. I've seen some companies that have 50% female board members um, and three or four uh, people of color. Uh, but there are other companies that haven't made any progress at all. And they're also getting pressure from uh, states like California who uh, have instituted regulations that say a certain number of women have to be on your board to go public or a certain number of people of color. Now you have companies like Goldman Sachs and, um, and BlackRock. Uh, you, you have the NASDAQ saying they're not going to let any company go public without some diversity. So they're feeling pressures from shareholders, from uh, advocacy groups, from um, customers to say, you know, if you're committed to uh, racial equality, you need to have people of color on your board and women. Um, so I started a company uh, that we announced in um, a few months ago called the Monarchs Collective, where our sole goal is to connect companies with black individuals, and I say black because we can say that now, we don't have to say multicultural or unconscious bias or all those other terms that hid what was really going on. Uh, where I started this company with my partner, Rabia DeLong, Delan Long, who's an executive coach and board member. And we, we're just being upfront about it and saying, our goal is to change the complexion of boards. And, and tell us, how, uh, how, how is that a business? Is it a for-profit, not-for-profit? How, how are you structuring yourself to achieve that? It's a for-profit because we figure you value things you pay for. Uh, <laughs> and search firms, uh, when they get the uh, assignment, uh, they call the one Black person they know in their um, uh, community or their circle of friends. And they say, oh, I need a diverse board member. Tell me who you know. And that Black person will give them a name because they want to uh, increase diversity. Um, but the search firm gets paid for it. Um, so we said, this is a business where we can be direct about what we're doing. Uh, and as uh, someone said earlier, maybe it was Maria or you, Jim, um, uh, diversity increases um, the performance of a board and increases the profits of a company. So there's no reason companies should not be willing to pay for this. And there are too many search firms out there that are still saying, oh, we can't find anyone. I had a search firm when I was head of a nominating governance committee who told me there were no black male CEOs out there. I said, that's just simply not true. So we have to change the filter. No one's looking for all CEOs anymore on their boards. Now companies are looking for cybersecurity uh, experts, international experts, marketing experts, Experts. Um, so let's use that, that growing filter and make those uh, new board members diverse also. Uh, and that's the way we're going to get there. And what a roster of boards you serve on, Deborah. I mean, right now, I know your current boards are AT&T, Burberry, uh, Procter & Gamble, and Marriott. And if you would, it's, <laughs> we're, we're here to talk about how do we help people to think about, prepare themselves, and, and position themselves properly to join boards. But what you're going through at Marriott now is an extraordinary circumstance, separate from any diversity issues. A little bit of color on on uh, how the board is handling the, the terrible situation you confronted as a company. 
Yes, well, um, for those who don't know, uh, we lost our CEO a couple of weeks ago um, uh, to cancer, uh, Arnie Sorensen, um, very young man at 62, a great leader, someone who's very committed to diversity and inclusion. And uh, so we had to quickly go into a CEO succession um, activity, uh, which we had already started uh, before his passing with his help. Uh, and luckily we had uh, several candidates who were uh, ready to, to step into the CEO uh, position. And we named a new CEO last week, uh, Tony Capano, and um, he's you know a great selection. And then we named uh, another uh, candidate, uh, Stephanie, um, as um, the president of the of the company. So we had two new leadership positions. Um, but it highlights that one of the main responsibilities of a board is to do CEO succession and to um, uh, replace a CEO if something uh, unfortunately tragic like this happens. But the part that really warms my heart and brings it back to diversity and inclusion is that Marriott Foundation gave $20 million to Howard University to start a, a hospitality program and to train uh, students at Howard about the hospitality program. And they named it in Arnie's um, um, oh, nice. tribute. And that just warmed my heart because he would be so happy about that. Um, mm -hmm. But the way I came up with this uh, variety of uh, boards is that I was very intentional about it. When I stepped down as president of um, CEO of BET about three years ago, I knew I wanted to stay on boards. I knew I wanted that to be an important part of my uh, retired life. Um, and so, you know, I only took those boards I was passionate about. I let people know I was looking. I saw what what white males did when they retired. They called their CEO friends and said, hey, I wanna be on four boards. Can I be on your company's board? And so I was, I was very deliberate and, and picked those companies I was interested in. And luckily uh, people called me and I put together uh, what I consider a great group of uh, uh, companies. And um, you know, it's been interesting during COVID doing it all from home via Zoom meetings, um, but it, it keeps me busy and I really love board service. You learn so much about industries and companies, how other CEOs do it. And I just think it's a great learning experience. And the thing I emphasize to um, young black people is it's a way to create wealth. We don't talk about that enough, but you get yeah. board fees, you get stock in the company. If the company does really well, which it will from your input, <laughs> the stock goes up um, and it's a great way to create wealth for yourself and for your family. And I think creating wealth is one way we can address the issues that were spotlighted uh, by so many uh, killings of, of young black men and um, the police brutality that we're suffering through. That's a great point about um, the, the, the wealth point, Deborah, and, and, and also your point about being intentional. Um, and I know, Julie, you've been very intentional as well in terms of the choices that you've made um, around, um, around your, your board presence. For someone that wants to join a board, what, what steps, Julie, would you advise they take to make sure they're board ready? And what are some of the barriers that you're still seeing? Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity to share. Uh, I'll, I'll frame sort of board readiness because I just uh, was uh, selected to be on my first corporate board. So Deborah and Maria have many more experiences to share, but I, I know how hard it is to get the first board seat. And so there's an introspective piece of work that I spent time doing to understand why I wanted to be on a board in what industry, understanding the responsibilities that I would have to the shareholders, to the employees, to the families, um, what my legal responsibilities would be, um, that I needed to know what I was bringing to the board. So um, beyond just being a marketer, because someone can always say, well, I already have a CMO. Well, how do I bring the other contributions for the strategy for crisis management here in healthcare and knowing how to manage through COVID? How do you communicate effectively as well as the transformation? All of that, becomes important in your personal board readiness. But then um, uh, I was taking a, a, a class recently around uh, racial uh, tensions and how do we build a bridge uh, to having some form of unification. 
And in that session, it was more about moving from networking to building relationships. So we do need to expand your, your network uh, to, to Deborah's point of being intentional. Well, it's not about how many people I know are on my LinkedIn, but if we thought about the last 10 LinkedIn posts that you've liked or you received comments about or the ones that you've actually uh, put out, how many of those uh, individuals are from people you don't know or from people that don't look like you or on topics that are broader than in my instance right now, just health, healthcare. All of that matters so that people know you because the point of difference I, I realized is that when I was looking for a job, I actually did some evaluations and then I applied. When it came to boards, they were already evaluating me and then they contacted me about my interests. And so making sure that as my own brand manager, that I was being true to who I am, know my brand value and proposition. So I'm consistent year over year and that when someone calls, they know what they're gonna get because it's it's been consistent from company to company or other advisory boards or community boards. And so I think everyone needs to be uh, true to their, their brand, their purpose, their calling, but then be very intentional about where you can serve and who you really want to be affiliated with to help grow the company uh, and build shareholder value. So Julie, there are two points you made there that I'd like uh, Maria and Deborah and Juliet all to comment on that I think are extremely important. And one is uh, the first board. Now, uh, now that you're on the first public company board, other opportunities will come your way because now you hit the radar screens. So the question is, what were the first before that that got you in a position to do that? You work in the not-for-profit world now, but you, that's new. You didn't always do that. So how did you think, and the second component of what you said relates to that, which is being deliberate about managing your own brand. So you've been a, a CMO extraordinaire for years. But the idea that you need to manage your own brand in a very deliberate fashion, I think is critically important here for, for not only achieving board representation and participation, but for all the things we heard about in the last session, we do have to be brand managers. So a little bit more from all of you on how do we manage that brand? What do we do to, in terms of steps to get yourself in a profile that you come to the attention of the search firms and the companies who are looking for talent like you. Uh, what, did you uh, did you serve on not, not-for-profit boards before? Uh, what are you doing to make sure you're showing that that your uh, that lifelong learning is a goal of yours? So you finished school, uh, you were lucky like Deborah, she couldn't get into Howard, so she had to go to Harvard. Uh, and she's had you know all these degrees, Brown before that, uh, you in, incredible credentials. But what other things are you doing? Are you working with uh, private equity uh, uh, people that you know who are in the private equity business who have a variety of boards that they need to populate? Are you, are you uh, packaging your skills in the right way? Uh, we heard uh, from uh, uh, Maria and we heard from Deborah about cyber is a, is a critical skill area we all need now. So how do you package your skills? What steps do you take to get yourself higher on the ladder of radar so that you have the opportunities that you want in life? Well, I'll, I'll jump in um, because you mentioned uh, my undergraduate, Brown University, and I'm sorry, I have a, a sick dog um, who just had some surgery yesterday, so that's the cone you're seeing. Um, but anyway, um, Brown University, they were the first not-for-profit board I served on. Uh, the first call I got was from their alumni magazine, and I've always been interested in magazines, so I went on the board of that. Then um, I was asked to serve on the board of uh, trustees, so I was elected to that and served there for many years. Um, and I was on the audit committee, which I didn't realize at the time, but that's a very uh, powerful skill you can um, translate to uh, for profit boards. Would you say um, it's the number one skill boards are looking for after they get through their uh, checklist of diversity that they'd like to have? Is that the most sought after skill set? I would say so in this day. They're always looking for financial experts for the audit committee. Uh, so CFOs or partners in um, um, audit Big shots firm, like Maria. Have, huh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so that is a very common skill that is looked for. But as I said before, the filter is expanding. Um, so I think the first thing you do, I think 
training on not-for-profit uh, boards is great. Um, and I think uh, to add on to what Julie said, the, the first thing you need to do is let people know you're interested in serving on boards, uh, whether that's- and How friends, do you do that, that it doesn't seem obnoxious? Um, I think you say, look, if you hear of any opportunities, I'm interested. And that can be to people who already serve on boards that are friend of yours. That can be search firm um, uh, people that you meet. Um, I heard one woman say that she was getting so many calls for another job from search firms, which she wasn't interested in. So she told those search firms, look, I'm not interested in moving uh, my position. But if you have a, a section of the company that's interested, that's looking for board candidates, I'm interested in that. So there are ways that you can do it. I got on my first board because the CEO uh, of my company at the time had too many boards and he suggested uh, my name. And so I went on the Kodak board in 1999. Uh, another way to do it is to contact the Monarchs Collective. We're building a, a data database as are a lot of other groups, not-for-profit groups, for-profit groups, um, and, and I'm getting amazing calls from individuals that I would never think um, were interested in, um, in board service. Um, um, you know, people that are not your normal, uh, typical board candidate, but who would make great board members, uh, physicians, um, um, you know, other executives in the music industry. Uh, I mean, just a lot of great people, uh, partners at law firms. Um, and th those um, yeah, boards have considered uh, white people that fit into those categories. So now it's time for them to uh, consider uh, diverse candidates. Um, and I should say our, um, our website is www.monarchscollective.com uh, where you can leave your information. Uh, but I think because of this uh, moment we're having now, a lot of people are reaching out um, and if you get a call about a board you're not interested in, refer someone else you know. Never let an opportunity go by where you don't take advantage of it. And I do that. I'm on four corporate boards, as we mentioned. So I can't be on anymore, and I wouldn't want to be on anymore. Um, so whenever I get calls, I refer them to someone I know. Um, so there are a lot of ways to, to let people know. And then I think coming up with a short board bio where you do highlight those things that are important important to boards. And you can talk to other board members, like as we talked about the audit committee. Uh, one other thing that we hope to do with uh, the Monarchs Collective is train people and not in a remedial way, but just what a boardroom is like. Um, you know, the committees, the, the meetings, you know, you usually spend the night when we could travel and have dinner with your Remember fellow. Remember that? <laughs> well, yeah, vaguely. Um, and it's all important. And, you know, sometimes boards have retreats and you're expected to bring your spouse. Uh, if you've never been on a board, you just don't know it. Um, so we want to make uh, the candidates feel more comfortable walking into their first boardroom. And when companies train you, when you join a board, they usually train you about the company, which is important too, but they don't train you about board service. Uh, so we're offering um, that uh, service and we hope to train companies on how to welcome diverse board members, um, you know, whether that's a sign. Yeah, because a lot of times, you know, you, they just put a butt in a seat and expect it to work. And so a <laughs> lot of times it does, but there are ways to make it uh, smoother, uh, like assigning a buddy to the new board member, um, you know, making sure they feel comfortable speaking up in board meetings, actually calling on them, making sure they get leadership um, positions like head of nomgov, nominating mm. governments, head of audit, uh, head of, um, any, you know, I'm head of the diversity committee. Yeah, compensation. Yeah. I'm head of the diversity committee uh, for uh, Marriott, which is a passion of mine. So to have the company have to report to me every quarter on the number of um, diverse executives, diverse owners of hotels, which is the heart of their business, uh, is something I really enjoy. So there are ways that you can make people feel more comfortable. I remember my first couple of board meetings, I was scared to death to speak just because I wasn't used to that environment. And, you know, they had to hide back leather chairs. And um, it was it was intimidating. And um, we're here to make get um, uh, more welcoming for for uh, all board members what, what would you say to um, anyone that is is taking a board seat 
for the first time and they're the only, whether it's the only person of color or the only woman. And, uh, and obviously there's a risk in that they will look to that person to represent that entire community that they're representing. Uh, what advice would you give to someone that's coming in? Um, obviously the board is, is trying to diversify. If you know it's, this, it, I'm sort of talking about like the, the tick box of yes, we've got a, a diverse candidate versus we've got a candidate that we know has the experience. And obviously in appointing people, you're making the assumption that they're appointing them for their experience and aptitude as well as the fact that they're a diverse member. But what advice would you give if they're the first? Maria? Sure, um, I'd say be ready, be prepared. Um, you know, there's a theme that Deborah alluded to as well as Julie, you know, be intentional, courage. Um, you know, you're, you're there and bring your passion. You know, you're there to create shareholder value and protect shareholder value. And I think if you go into this thinking that, you know, you want a position and you want to contribute, you know, for X meetings a year and X comp, I think that's the wrong attitude. I really get behind it. And, you know, um, you know, Jim, I've seen you work aboard. I mean, Jim gets behind it. He thinks broadly about the business, what would create value, who in the ecosystem they need to know, what they're not thinking about. Uh, it's more than just, you know, showing up for that one, one or two meetings. I also want to just give a, you know, a great shout out. It, what a fantastic title to this conference, uh, Action Speaks Louder Than Words. And I, I'm really pleased with Deborah's you know, the Monarch Collective, Julie, I don't know what you think, but, you know, I, I was recently approached um, about a board position, but one they didn't want me to fill, you know, they wanted someone else to fill. And, you know, I called Jim and Juliet because they know absolutely everyone. So, you know, people who are looking for board members, these are the people to call, people like Jim and Juliet. And, you know, right away, they produced a list of candidates to fill that spot. But, um, you know, if you think about it, I mean, I suppose an action coming out of this, it'd be, it's, it's a really weird way to do it. I mean, you really, I mean, it business is ecosystems, it's networks, it's intentional networks, it's, it's value. Um, uh, but, you know, that there's got to be a better way. And, and I think the Monarch Collective is, is a good way. And, you know, I want to want to let Julie add in here for a moment, but I would just say, um, yeah, I'm, I'm on two public company boards. One is more of a go governance role uh, for an SEC public company. And then the other one, I'm pleased uh, to, to share that is with Clarem Acquisition Corp, which is a, a special purpose acquisition company that Jim McCann started. And, and I think it's really important to understand your motivation for joining a board. So, you know, this one particularly is very entrepreneurial. You know, it's all about helping companies grow and getting behind them and helping them scale and really making them successful, you know, for generations to come. And then that's a different skill set than, you know, one of my other boards, which is, you know, really a, as a financial steward. And, and I think sometimes you need to understand your own motivation because you'll bring the skill that they need. Of course, you know, in my case, it'll be financial skill, but there's so much more they need. So don't limit yourself to just that. There are so much, so many other things you can do. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm, here just in awe of both Deborah, Julie, and, you know, Juliet and Jim. And I think one thing I've seen is that they really bring, they bring it all, so not just a niche. One thing, Jim, if I can add yeah, on, Julie. what Maria, Maria was saying, um, as a new uh, board member, I think it's important for you to have your own personal board of directors is what I call it, right? So I didn't know what I did not know. You can be as ready as you think you are, but day one is day one, right? And so uh, to Deborah's point, it's a room that I had not been in when I'm on that side of the table versus presenting to a board, right? And so I actually went back to uh, my longtime mentor, friend, former boss three times, and he's been on many more boards than I have. So I said, okay, time for the teacher to teach the student. If you have your own personal board, 
then you have people who are advocating for you that know about your brand that can speak and put their weight behind your candidacy. And then of course they want you to succeed. So they're mm -hmm. going to be there to hold you up. They're going to ask questions of, have you looked at the SEC filings? Have you been looking at the 10 Ks and the 10 Qs or whatever else? They're making sure that the things that someone else might not tell you in your onboarding, that you're paying attention to the said and not said aspects of things. Um, it's also important for each of us to take ownership and accountability. So that's a big theme in my life. And, and to, to Deborah's point, in addition to the Monarch, um, I attended a 2017 Deloitte's um, board and leadership forum. And that was the true place where I spent a couple of days really understanding what does it mean to be a board member and how do I get myself ready? They were asking questions that I didn't even thought about. How do I ensure I have an answer in my heart and my head before it came out of my mouth. But I also met a woman on the East Coast named Sheila Ronning and Sheila created the um, women in the boardroom. And so that opened up a new opportunity for many women that were looking for board seats. Then last year, I met a woman on the West Coast, Sarah Zapp and Sarah created, um, I think her group is called Beyond Board. And so that was another group of people that are gonna hear things that I will not see through the uh, connections that I have. And then last week I actually met a uh, Jerusha Stewart and Jerusha and, and a couple of people just formed on the West Coast, um, an organization called Take Your Seat, and it's about boards. And then Deborah and I are fortunate enough to be a part of the Executive Leadership Council, and they have board readiness, they have a board book, so when their member companies and others are looking for uh, candidates, they reach out to those of us in the ELC that are ready to add boards. So it, we have to move beyond the executive search firms and ensure that we're connecting to other organizations that have access and opportunity so that your name is on more than one person's list. Right. Um, because I have to spread my, my reality of how many people will advocate for the brand Julie. I want about six, seven, eight people doing that because I don't know who will be in the room that I actually want my name. Yeah, to well, well said, well said. Right. I would add the 30% club to that list of, of great organizations as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, one last and then question. I would I would just add the board list. I mean, there's so many. And now to Julie's point and Julie, congratulations on your first board. Uh, to Julie's point, even colleges are offering courses now. Um, Stanford has a course. I hear Harvard Business School is starting a school, a, um, a course on board readiness. So educational institutions are realizing uh, this is important and it needs to come out of the dark. You know, we need to be able to talk about this yeah. in public. Right. And as Julie said, let people know you're interested. But I would just say, and Juliet, I'm gonna let you speak. I'm sorry, we keep talking over you. Um, but the well, other- she, She's on a marathon, so she needs a break every now and then. Oh, okay. <laughs> The other important thing before you accept a board is to make sure you have confidence in the CEO and the other board members. I mean, the last thing you wanna do is get on the board of a company uh, that doesn't have uh, the right ethical approach to business. And you saw that with uh, Enron and other companies that have got getting, gotten in trouble. Um, and you know, I always pay very close attention to my CEO interview to see if I'm really ready to to put my brand on this person's company because that's what you're doing. If something goes wrong, they're gonna look at you also. I've been sued so many times by being on a, on a board and it happens and usually they're frivolous lawsuits, but you don't wanna associate yourself with someone um, uh, who might not have the same uh, approach to business that you have. And I, I heard Laura Tyson, who was on the board of Kodak with me, and she just recently retired from the AT&T board. And one time I heard her say that serving on boards is the most most dangerous thing she does uh, in her career because you know you never know when something's going to happen. So you need to keep that in the back of your mind. It's not always about them wanting you. It's about you wanting them. <laughs> so don't forget that. And there really isn't enough director's liability insurance. I mean, the deductibles on them are so high. So right. I, I think you're right. You have to know that going in. Juliet, one of the common themes we just heard uh, referenced, but not explicitly. Julie, you talking about uh, having a network and being on several lists. Maria, you being a mentor and being me being mentored and being a mentor to so many that I know of. The, the common theme there, uh, Deborah, is that when a board is picking a person, whether, whether they have diversity in mind or not, what really happens is you call a friend who knows that person and says, tell me about them. 
What they really want to avoid is the big mistake. The disruptive person, the person who has issues that aren't apparent on their resume. So it's it, it, by de facto, it's a bit uh, exclusionary, uh, uh, but not with the intention of being exclusionary. Boards want to make the mistake of not uh, putting, uh, putting someone on a board who isn't going to be a, a board ready, who's going to be a liability, who's going to be disruptive to the process and not contributing in a positive way. And, and I think that's what you're alluding to, all of you, in how you're helping people to get ready for boards. A, to be that voice or to help them to have a, a network of people that there's a bunch of touch points, a board that might be considering you has to get that, are they nuts question answered. And, and also access. I, th I think that's the other key one, which is, you know, how do we, how do we broaden the pipeline and how do we help people that are searching for board members look outside of their normal purview and also how do we help talent that we know is board ready or could be board ready but doesn't get the normal opportunity or access or in the same circles as people already on the board there's so much incredible practical advice that you've all just shared I, I want to say thank you we could have I, I feel like we could keep going and going and going on this topic um, and I know it's um, an incredibly important one as we as we drive um, equity and, and diversity and inclusion forward. So I just want to say thank you to all because you've all got such amazing experience and, and thank you for being part of today. I want to add my thanks. A, 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 I think there are some great practical lessons. I, I suspect that all three thank of you, you will have a, a rather large inbound uh, outreach this afternoon <laughs> and beyond uh, because you have so much to offer to a, a community of people who can contribute so much. Juliet, I know you have another session coming up, but that's what I was referring to, the marathon we're putting you through this afternoon. And I just want to share a story with you. Uh, my wife and I, uh, 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 Marin Alsop, is uh, going to do a fireside chat with Juliet coming up now. And my wife and I have been fans of Marin for a long time, even though she's only 20 years old. Uh, 30 mm. years ago, I remember, uh, on Long Island, she was leading one of the fellow monarchs on Long Island. And her mentor, uh, uh, Deborah, you've had a terrific uh, group of mentors I, that I know of, uh, but her mentor was a fellow by the name of Leonard Bernstein. Wow. And as a conductor, you can't have a better mentor teacher. And uh, we, we had the privilege of seeing her lead uh, Philharmonic and we had uh, very good seats up on the right-hand side of the stage, uh, facing the stage. And uh, Marin conducted a symphony that night. Her mentor had just died a short period of time before that, Leonard Bernstein. And to watch her conduct with such passion, with tears streaming down her face, mm -hmm. when I told uh, Mary Lou earlier today that we, we'd get to watch you with Marit, she says, I'll never forget that night. Mm -hmm. So how lucky are you and how lucky are we to get to listen to you talk to Marin coming up? We're incredibly lucky. And um, we also get a sneak peek at her, her documentary that's coming out as well, which is, which is amazing. And it, it gave me goosebumps. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.